Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for SPIRIT, the stimulating program initiative for retirees that inspires thought. I'm Judy Steinig, Director of Community Programs for the Orthodox Union, and it's my honor to host this program. The OU created SPIRIT several years ago as an on-site program, and we're happy now to bring it to you as a virtual program. The OU recognizes that as the generation of baby boomers lead professional responsibilities, they're looking for educational stimulation. And the goal of the SPIRIT program is to provide active retirees, not yet retirees, empty nesters, sandwich generation parents, and seniors with the opportunities for spiritual and intellectual growth. Of course, we know now with coronavirus, we're all stuck at home, and SPIRIT seems to be the perfect way to be engage everyone in a virtual setting. Today's session is called Creating Certainty in uncertain times, how to live with confidence in retirement. I would imagine that everybody here is nervous every time we hear that the stock market took a huge plunge because of Corona. And we are so concerned about what is happening with our funds and what's going to happen in the future. It is an honor to have as our presenter, Elizabeth Prale, who has spoken on a number of occasions for the OU on on-site programs. Mr. Prale has been a financial advisor with Wealth Advisory Group since 2002, with a focus on the retirement arenas. I know that he will be offering some very important information. Now, if you have any questions during the program, please contact me at Judy Steinig at steinigj at ou.org. That's S-T-E-I-N-I-G-J at ou.org, and I will make sure that Mr. Prell receives the questions. It's my honor now to turn the program over to him. Thank you, Judy. Good morning, everybody, and Lagba Omer Sameach. What Judy did mention is I'm also a, a, a Rebbe. I teach uh, Judaic studies at Stern College, so I'll start with a, a Mamar Chazal that's relevant to our times and to our topic. The Gemara in Zvachim on Daf Tzadik teaches us, Ein simcha kehataras hasvekos. There is no greater joy than resolving uncertainties. Now, we are living through a time of great challenges, primarily to our health, but also to our wealth, both regarding income. We know people who are out of work, people who are have had their pay cut, and in terms of investments, which we have probably, many of us have experienced and are experiencing on a daily basis. But perhaps worst of all is the uncertainty. See, we're still not sure about so many things. How does this virus spread? Who it will affect? How severely will the illness strike a given person? What are the long-term medical effects and when will it finally end now i'm not a doctor so i know no more than you do about the medical questions even the doctors are learning day by day as they go forward but our focus today will be on the financial challenges and uncertainties that have been exacerbated by the current crisis and to talk about some approaches to those uncertainties so let's begin by looking at differences between the two distinct phases of our financial lives, accumulation and distribution. So is, is distributing wealth different than accumulating wealth? And what we'll discover is it is. See, we have to think of these two different phases as a mountain. In accumulation, we're earning money, saving money, putting it away for the future. Our cash flow is creating our net worth. It's like climbing up a mountain. In distribution, we're doing the opposite. We're taking that net worth that we have created over the years and we're turning that into cash flow. Now, there are a couple of valid similarities between the mountain you're looking at and the two phases of our financial lives. First of all, 
in both cases, gravity is a force, is a challenge that affects the mountain climber. When he's climbing, climbing, it affects him one way. When he's coming down the mountain, it affects him differently, but it's equally as great a challenge. Same thing with accumulation and distribution. There are challenges, the same names of challenges will appear on both sides, but with different results or different ramifications. The other thing is that in the picture, it's very nice and pretty. You have an even mountain, but the same distance going up is going down. And the truth is in our lives, that's not so far from the truth. Our accumulation lives are, let's say, roughly 40 years. And distribution right now, as we're going to discover, needs to be, we need to be prepared for at least 30 years and perhaps even longer as longevity increases. So what are those challenges? Well, the first one is mortality, the risk of a person passing away. Now, during our earning years, when we're raising a family, the danger that that poses is that if a person dies prematurely, then he won't, his family won't be taken care of. His family will be without a main source of income. How will they continue? That's the challenge. In retirement and distribution, while at the beginning of distribution, there may be a fear of not having enough time to enjoy all the things you wanted to do, but as people live longer, as they go through it, the bigger concern, and research has shown this out, the biggest concern that people have is, and it's not nice to say, but living too long. Because the longer they live, the bigger chance they'll have of running out of money, which is no way to live. So that is a major challenge and concern that people have in retirement. The risk of illness or injury. Well, when a person is in his working years, if he becomes uh, sick or injured and can't work, he becomes disabled, then again, that puts a stop, whether temporary or permanent, depending on the severeness of the illness, to his earning power, to his income for his family. It's going to affect his cash flow. In distribution, you don't have to worry about not being able to go to work anymore. That's the nice part about retirement. But a, an illness, a long-term illness, a chronic illness, can be financially devastating. And there's no longer income to draw upon to pay for the care. Then you have to dip into your assets. Those same assets that were supposed to that are supposed to be providing the income that we need to live on now have to be robbed, borrowed for taking care of the person who needs the long-term care. Market volatility, the ups and downs of the market. The market will be volatile. The market will always go up and down. While we're in our earning years and putting money away, volatility can be your friend. A person who is fortunate enough to still have a, a job right now and who has money taken out of his paycheck every month to go into his 401k plan, the fact that the market went down by 30% or more is a blessing because that money is now buying more value than it did the month before. When the market goes down, your dollars go further. That's what's known as dollar cost averaging. But when you're in the distribution phase, Volatility can be a killer because when the market goes down and you have to still take out money because you need to live, you need money to income to live on, and it has to come from those assets, and you have to take out money when the market is down, you're not going to benefit then when the market goes back up because those dollars are gone. And especially if that happens in the beginning of retirement, it can really throw off your entire retirement plan if the down years come right at the beginning. Tax deferred vehicles, retirement plans, 401ks, IRAs, etc. So during your accumulation years, during your working years, those are the best friends you have. All the conventional wisdom says, sock as much money away in your 401k as you can because you get a tax deduction for it. 
It's tax, it's pre-tax money that goes in. And it grows tax-free as well. You don't get 1099s each year for the growth. Beautiful. But then when you get to distribution, it completely turns around on its head. It's now the worst asset to hold because every dollar that comes out is going to be fully taxable. In addition to which you don't even control when you can get the money. The government tells you that you must start taking the money. And now it's already up to age 72. But the go if the market is going up and you want to let the money ride and grow, sorry, Uncle Sam wants his cut. So he's going to make you take distributions every year and you have to pay regular income tax on that money. There are no tax benefits at all to that money. And finally, inflation. Inflation, you know, Baruch Hashem, for the last uh, couple of decades, it hasn't been a major issue, uh, but we are probably all old enough to remember the bad old 70s and 80s when inflation was uh, double digit, double digit, digit inflation. So while you're working, and there's no, by the way, with all the money the government is borrowing now, it's hard to imagine how inflation won't uh, make a comeback. Well, while you're working, the answer to inflation is earn more. That's the solution. When you're in retirement, you're not earning money anymore. The only solution to the inflation challenge is to spend less. So now that we have, so let's review, I'm sorry, let's review this six risks that we alluded to in the above slides that we face in retirement, and then we'll talk about how to deal with them. Longevity, which is the fear of running out of money. And I wanna share something with you to show you what that actually means. Here is a life expectancy graph that shows you you have two 65 year olds male and female not in the top um, rating of health but preferred not preferred best uh, but reasonably healthy and the red line represents what are the odds of both of them no longer being alive so uh, you can see it starts way down here uh, it takes a long time to even get to, to 10%. So even to get to 10% takes until age 85 for both of them. That means there's an 80 a 90% chance that one of them will still be alive at 85. In fact, I want to start right here at age 83. Keep this in mind. There's only a 6% chance that both members of the couple will, know, will, not, will not be alive at age 83. There's a 94% chance that one of them will still be alive at age 83. It doesn't even reach the 50% mark until somewhere between 92 and 93. That means in a typical couple who are 65 years old in reasonably good health, half of, in half of those couples, one of them will still be alive at 93. And considering that we live in the New York, New Jersey area, I, I assume that most, that's where we're, most of us are calling in from today. The research has shown that the states in the United States that have the longest longevity are New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And that might be because we have so many top quality medical facilities and hospitals within a short driving distance. In addition, the single most indicative uh, feature as far as longevity goes is income. Wealthier people live longer, clearly because they have access to uh, good health care, 
And um, it also could be because they're higher educated people who, generally speaking, take better care of themselves. But when we think of it that way, we shouldn't, we in our world can plan for that 50% marker. First of all, because half the people will live longer. So even if we look at the 75% um, level, you're talking 96, age 96. One of the people in the couple has a one in four chance of living to age 96, which means you can't plan on running out of money at age 95 if there's a 25% chance that someone's gonna, still gonna be alive and need it. So that's a long time to prepare for. The second risk is health, specifically the need for long-term care. In a nutshell, re the recent uh, statistics have shown that men, 60% of men are going to need long-term care and 80% of women are going to need long-term care. Those are very high numbers. Let's turn to the next risk, interest rate risk. Right now we're, in a, as we know, in a very, very low interest rate environment. And in fact, we've been, in, we've been there since 2008. In the old days, people used to think, I'll take my money, I'll put it into treasury bills, I'll earn 8% a year, which, in, which you could do 20 years ago. And therefore, your million dollars uh, in treasury bills will provide you with $80,000 a year, which isn't bad. Except that today you take these same million dollars, you put it in treasury bills, you're going to get about 1% or $1,000, or $10,000, hardly anything to uh, get up and dance about. So that's a serious risk. So the low interest rates of the past 10 years or 12 years cannot keep up with risk number four, which is inflation. Inflation, even in the low in inflation environment that we're in, is going to outpace what you can earn in interest, which then brings us to the requirement for a more aggressive approach, such as stocks, which have the opportunity to earn more money, but which carry risk number five, which is market risk. We have to be able to absorb and tolerate the ups and downs, the volatility, the swings in the market, which can be difficult and painful. And there are many people who can't. More people lose money in the market from bad behavior, meaning panicking and selling when the market goes down, than for any other reason. And finally, there's this different risk, which is a little more subtle. It's called sequence of return risks. We alluded to it before. It's not only a question of what the market returns, but the order of those returns, because if the market, as we, as I noted before, if you retire and start counting on your, on those assets to produce income for you, and then you get hit with a bear market in the first two years, and you have to take out money while the market continues to go down and go down, even when the market retires, all your plans are going to go up in smoke because you were planning on having that money last you for X number of years. Now it's going to last X minus something. And so the sequence of returns, the order in which the market gives you the returns makes a big difference. There's a handout that is on the, um, that I gave to the OU that's available to you after the um, program where you can delve into this um, more in a more sophisticated fashion. So these are the uncertainties. These are all the problems. How can we create certainty? How can we fix these problems? So let's go, let's figure out what our goal is in retirement. Our goal is we work during our working years. Many of us have had a regular income, a steady income. Even if we were in business for ourselves, we had some idea going into the year of what we were going to be able to make. So wouldn't it be nice if in retirement we could replace our regular steady income with regular steady income? So in the old days, in the old days, there were a few ways of doing this. One, there was social security. Two, most people had company pensions. 
the pension pays you money on a regular basis for as long as you live. In 1975, 62%, almost two thirds of full-time workers had company pensions. So between the social security and the pensions, you supplement that with your private savings. That was the plan for retirement. Today, we still have social security, but we're reading all the time how social security is running out of money. Company pensions, less and less common. In 1975, 62% had company pensions. Today, only 22% of full-time workers have pensions. And in the private sector, that's only 13%. If you work for the government, you still that's still one of the benefits of working for the government. Government workers, 77% have pensions. But in the private sector, only 13% have pensions. Instead, instead, we have 401k plans. So you may say, okay, so I used to have a pension from my company, now I have a 401k plan from my company. However, there is a big difference. Pensions are guaranteed for life. A 401k plan, you, the owner of the plan, you're responsible to make the right investments. You're responsible to withdraw only enough money to make sure that you don't run out of money. No one's gonna, you don't get a do-over. If you take out too much and you run out of money, that's it. It's, your, it's our responsibility as the owners of the 401k plans to make sure that they last as long as we want them to and need them to. And of course, there, there are still private savings. So bottom line is in the old days, two out of the three legs of this pension stool were made up of guaranteed income. Today, there's only one, and that one is Social Security. So let's uh, dig into Social Security a little bit, since that's the only guaranteed income that most of us have. So well, the first thing is the fear that's going around is that Social Security's days are numbered, it's going to run out of money, and now what happens? Well, I'm not going to get anything. The truth is probably, and again, this is simply my guess, which comes from different things that I've read over the years, is that those of us who are over 50 are probably going to be okay. When you hear that the Social Security Trust Fund is going to run out in 2033, that doesn't mean there's no more money to be paid. Because the truth is, the money is anyway being paid out of government revenues each year. That trust fund is a mythical number. Now, obviously, there will need to be changes to the plan in order that the country doesn't go bankrupt. So, but generally speaking, when changes are made and when they've been made in the past, they've been made to keep the program viable for the people who are already in it. And the changes are made for the younger people. For example, back in the Carter years, they, the, the retirement age used to be 65. Today, it's 66. For those of who are reaching uh, who were born between 1955 and 1960, and anyone born over 19, after 1960, it's 67. It's entirely reasonable that that should be raised. People are living longer. There's no reason they shouldn't, at least actuarially, for the purpose of Social Security, work longer as well. Another important point to note about Social Security is that the benefits that we receive are taxable as income, mostly. Mostly taxable as income in the United States. Not in Israel. There's a treaty between the United States and Israel that exempts Social Security benefits for Americans who live in Israel, both from Israeli taxes and from American taxes. Okay, who's going on Aliyah now? That's a big benefit. Okay, how much is my benefit? Well, for those of you who are collecting already, you know the answers, but let me give you some uh, idea for those who are still before that point. 
the maximum benefit in 2020 at what is called full retirement age, which is somewhere between 65, let's call it 66 or 67, is $36,000 a year. And that's if you earned the equivalent of $137,000 in today's dollars throughout your career. If you earn the maximum social security taxable benefit, you get the maximum benefit. If you earned less than that over the years, you'll get a lower benefit. But the maximum is 36,000. And as we said before, what they call full retirement age depends on when you were born. If you were born before 1954, it's 66. After 1960, it's 67. In between, it's 66 and a couple of months. So in a couple, each person who contributed to the Social Security plan collects separately based on their own earnings record. So a couple can get two different checks. In fact, there's something called the spousal benefit that even if a spouse did not work at all, but if the other spouse had, did work and did contribute to social security, the non-working spouse is eligible to, to a benefit equal to half of what the working spouse receives at full retirement age. As, um, even though they have no earnings of their own. Social Security, the, what they call full retirement age, again, 66 or 67. A person is allowed to start taking benefits at age 62, but it'll be a reduced amount for the rest of their lives. On the other hand, if a person waits until age 70, they get an increase of 8% per year for each year that they wait. So they'll get a higher amount for, per year. So for example, if the person uh, if the 66-year-old retiring in 2020 would get $36,000 a year, if he waits until he reaches age 70, he would then receive $45,000 a year. And by the way, these amounts are, are indexed for inflation. They go up each year. There is no advantage to wait past age 70. Even if you are still working, you start collecting at 70. Now, the big question is, when is the best time to begin benefits? If you start earlier, you'll get less, but you'll collect for a longer amount of time. If you start later, you'll get more, but you have to wait all those years to start benefiting from it. So, as we'll discover, generally speaking, the older, the better. First of all, you get that guaranteed 8% a year increase to your benefits. Where else can you get a return of 8% a year guaranteed? Nowhere. So for that reason alone, it's a good reason to wait. Assuming, of course, that you don't need the money. Obviously, any, if you need the money, then you need to take it earlier. But if a person has the option, then economically, it's better to wait. And you may wonder, yeah, but what if I don't live long enough to make up the difference? Well, the crossover point is age 83. Sound familiar? What are the chances of a person not living till age 83 from age 65? Even for a man alone, the chances of living past age 83 are 80%. And when you're talking about a couple, which is how we have to do the thinking here, as I'll get to in a minute, the chances of living past 83 are 94%. So from an actuarial point of view, you will most probably come out way ahead by waiting till age 70 to start collecting. Even, even if you're living alone, but especially if you're part of a couple. Now, let me explain why the couple part is so important. Let's talk about a hypothetical case where we have a married couple where the older spouse, and I'm just going to, I'm going to call him the husband, is made substantially more than the younger spouse. There is something called a survivor benefit, which means 
that when the first, if the couple is collecting and they're collecting different amounts, if the higher benefit spouse dies first, the, low, the other one steps into that benefit. They lose their own, but they step into the higher benefit. So if you have the husband who dies first, because the husband often, does, check out Survived by His Wife by Alan King if you want uh, some good laughs. If the husband dies first, the, and he's getting a bigger benefit than his wife has been receiving until now, when he passes away, the wife drops her benefit, but she steps into his higher benefit. So if he waits until 70 to start collecting, and he's collecting the higher amount, that higher amount doesn't end with his passing, it transfers to his wife for the rest of her life. And that's the most important reason why a couple should wait until age 70 for the higher earning spouse to begin taking benefits because it covers two lives, not just one. Now, there are other strategies available to maximize income, such as through the use of a spousal benefit, which allows the low earning spouse to collect half of the other spouse at age, other spouses age 66 or 67 amount. These get a little bit more complicated. These are the things that a financial advisor can help you with. So that takes care of social security. Now, so in the absence of a company pension, how can we create more guaranteed, more certain, income? And the answer is by creating our own pension with annuities. What is an annuity? The definition of an annuity is it pays money guaranteed for as long as a person lives. That's what an annuity is designed to do. Guaranteed income for as long as you live. Now there are different types and we'll talk about that. The most common and oldest type of annuity is a fixed annuity. It pays money for, uh, you give the money to an insurance company and they promise to pay you money for as long as you live or you can even design it for as long as you and your spouse live so that your spouse isn't left out in the cold. You can even build in annual increases to protect against inflation just like Social Security does. You can even get a guarantee that the company will return all the money you deposited with them in case the person who owns the contract dies before collecting the full amount that he deposited. Because that's the thing that scares a lot of people about buying an annuity. Well, I'm gonna give the company all my money and then I'll die the next month and they keep it all, well, not with this, condition attached. You can attach this condition that they, if in case of the owner passes away, the company has to return the unused, uncollected premiums. Of course, all these things come with a price. Now, this is, sounds like a great idea, but the problem is that it's ex they're expensive and they really fall into the category of a fixed income instrument, which Unless you have a boatload of money, you probably will not have enough money to buy gu enough guaranteed income for a lifetime with just a fixed in income instrument alone, especially in the current environment when interest rates are so low. This is probably not a good time to go out and buy a fixed annuity. In order to really you have a better shot at making your money last for 30 plus years. You need to have market exposure. That's where the growth comes from. So you need to have money in the market. But what about the market risk we talked about earlier? I'm afraid. I don't want to lose my money. Or even if I'm, I don't want to even go through the roller coaster ride. What if the market goes down? What can I do to protect myself from that? So there are vehicles out there that address this problem. And here's my favorite. 
It's a relatively new one. It's been around a few years, but it works beautifully. The strategy is to take a portion of one's retirement assets that are not needed for the next six years. You invest in this product that tracks the S&P 500 index and it provides between 20 and 30 percent downside protection. So if at the end of six years, if the market is down 20 or in some cases even 30 percent, the company is going to absorb that loss and you'll get all the money back that you put in. So let's talk about the 20 percent protection one because that's the one I like the best. So let's say you took $100,000 and put it in. Six years later, the S&P is up 50% over those six years, which is not unreasonable. You get back 150,000. If it's up 100%, you get 200,000. Now, the catch is that there's a cap on how much they'll let the money grow. If the market goes up 10 times, you're not going to get back 10 times as much, which of course has never happened. Now here's the, believe it or not, this just, I just found out something last night. They just changed the cap. The cap used to be 150%, which means if you put in 100,000, the most you could get back after six years, Nebuch, was 250,000. They changed it. Last night, I got a notice from this company that they are raising the cap to 225%, which means you put in 100,000, if the market should grow, Kane Yervu, to 325,000, you get back 325,000. If it grows more than that, Nebuch, you're stuck with only 325,000. I mean, that's, that's an amazing deal. Ah, and on the downside, if after six years, the market is down, which does happen 15% of the time over any six year period. The first 20% of loss, the company has to cover themselves. So you'll get back your full $100,000. The only risk is, well, if the market is down 25%, well, then you'll only get back 95,000 right? Because the company is absorbing the first 20% of the loss, the first $20,000 of loss. So that's a very attractive offer for people who are afraid of the market, but who need market exposure. It's a way to participate in the market and take away a lot of this thing. Um, so we talked about a fixed annuity that provides guaranteed lifetime income, but no market exposure. And we talked about a way to be invested in the market with significant downside protection, but no guaranteed income. So how can I turn that investment into a stream of income? Well, one answer is, the easy answer is, at the end of the six years, take the money, whatever it is, and if you roll it into a fixed annuity at the end of the six year period, Maybe interest rates will be better then, but they'll be higher. Remember, we're only talking about a, taking the portion of money that you're not going to need to live on for the next six years. This is the long-term money that you have. Now, there is a third option that combines the two concepts we just discussed, exposure to market gains with protection of guaranteed growth during accumulation and the guarantee of lifetime income while still having the potential to gain from a rising market during the distribution phase. The, uh, these are known as variable annuities with guaranteed living withdrawal benefits. They are complex and I don't feel it would be appropriate or fair for you to overwhelm you with the details and nuances of, of this option today. I just want to let you know that such an option is available and it could be very valuable in the right circumstances. So we've talked about addressing longevity risk. We talked about addressing market risk, sequence of return risks. What about healthcare? What about long-term care risks? Well, 
the risk is that it's very expensive to pay for long-term care. To have someone, a licensed person, come to your home for an eight or 10 hour shift per day could run you $75,000, $80,000 per year. If you need a nursing home, we're talking upwards of $125,000 to $150,000 per year per person. These are enormous numbers. And remember, it has to come from your assets. It's unlikely that you plan for this in your income. Medicare provides minimally. Medicare is designed to help people with acute conditions get better, not to take care of people with chronic illness. Medicaid, Medicaid is for poor people. You have to give up all your assets. You have to forfeit all your assets in order to be eligible for Medicaid. And if you give up all the assets today, you have to wait five years to apply for Medicaid. So what are the alternatives? Well, the simple answer that's been around for about 30 years is long-term care insurance. And long-term care insurance does have some advantages. The premiums are probably are tax deductible. A certain portion of the premiums are tax deductible. The benefit is tax-free. The premium for this product is lower than the alternative product I'm going to present to you. And if you live in New York State, there's a 20% tax credit on your state income taxes for a long-term care premium paid, which means if you paid $5,000 for a long-term care policy, you get a $5,000 credit, not a deduction, a credit towards the tax owed to New York for the premium paid. Not bad. But what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages is it is pure insurance. Use it or lose it. If Barak Hashem, you live a long, healthy life and you never need long-term care, that, excuse me. And you never need long-term care, then you've lost the money because it's like your car insurance or your homeowner's insurance. If you don't make a claim, you don't collect. Secondly, these policies, all of them today, only pay on a reimbursement, base, reimbursement basis, which means they're not gonna just write you a check. You have to demonstrate, submit bills to demonstrate who you're paying and how much you're paying them and why the need is there to get the money reimbursed from the company. You can understand that this could be a big challenge for somebody who's already in a, in, in a long-term care situation. And finally, no long-term care insurance policy that's available for purchase today will pay in Israel. So if you, there, you have any thoughts of making Aliyah, moving to Israel, this is not the answer. Fortunately, there is an alternative the alternative is a hybrid of life insurance with a long-term care benefit. So as an example, if a husband and a wife both buy a $500,000 policy, that means there's a life insurance benefit of $500,000. So if they never use it for long-term care, their beneficiaries, their children, their grandchildren, their charities, whoever they name is going to get $500,000 when they pass away. If you have a long-term care need, you will be able to access your own insurance benefit while you are still alive at the rate of up to $20,000 a month, which is 4% of the policy. Now at that rate, it'll run out in 25 months, which is a little over two years, but you've gotten the full benefit of the policy while you were alive. And as we mentioned before, any money not used during your lifetime will go to your beneficiary at the passing of the policy owner. The benefits are there's a guaranteed return, unlike the traditional long-term care policy. The benefit is paid in cash, not reimbursement. So you can 
essentially use it any way you want. And it also pays in. There are policies that will pay in Israel. So these are the options that are available to mitigate the long-term care risk. So in conclusion, I hope you have discovered that there are ways to create certainty in retirement during these uncertain times by implementing strategies that we talked about today. Now the teacher side of me enjoyed sharing this information with you today, and I really hope you feel you learned something from our time together. Judy will be sending out a survey questionnaire later today. It would be very helpful to the OU and to me to receive your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizer. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly learned a lot. I think everybody really appreciated all the information. I expect a lot of questions will be coming through. So thank you so much for giving us a little more certainty in these uncertain times. So um, I just want to remind everybody that um, the, this, the SPIRIT program will continue on Thursday at 11 o'clock with Adina Siegel, who will be speaking about understanding dementia, warning signs, and caregiving strategies. That's something that's not exactly, we know it's not upbeat, but we know it's something we need to be thinking about for ourselves. And many of us may be in the situation of being caregivers, and there's a lot of information that we need, particularly during this time. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I wanna to thank Elezer Prail for the amazing presentation he gave us. And following um, the information he said that you'll be receiving, we will be, I will be sending out the recording of today's presentation to all of our registrants as soon as it's ready. It takes a good few hours. It might not be until tomorrow, but uh, you'll be getting everything along with the materials and we thank you again. Take care everybody. Happy Lagba Omer, enjoy the rest of the day.